Here is somebody who not only knows Chinese art, but also he can come out of, of the shell of the field, of the narrow field, and begin to talk about other things. He always began with the, with the object, with the painting, and let the painting speak for itself. I have to say, he was one of the very first people, really, to emphasize um, women's education and, you know, to accept graduate students who were women. He was very interested in accepting graduate students from Asia, women graduate students, um, who would go back and really uh, spread the, um, you know, the kind of education they were getting. You know, he still um, maintained the sense that this field can only grow, it's never going to shrink. So let's see how far we can take it. And that was actually the dynamic of his very late career as well. His legacy is a kind of ex explosion of research in all kinds of different directions rather than necessarily just following the straight and narrow. Uh, I mean, not only the kind of connoisseurship and new methodologies, but the, the bigger what I call the so what and who cares questions. He addressed explicitly, often implicitly, always. He was a very unusual scholar in that he was so open to other things. So it's difficult not to become friendly after you spend that much time talking to someone. And he loved to tell stories, and I like to listen to them. Jim was in the vanguard of those people who knew the language of style as a vocabulary for talking about other things. He was happy to make, to make his uh, images online and everything online, and he yeah, he, I think he promotes writing for, um, for general public as well. I mean, promotes uh, writing for the general public as well. People who wrote uh, created an immortality for themselves through their writings, that that was something that never died and that would always be respected. And Jim, I think, latched on to that idea if he hadn't already developed it full form himself, but it was something that was very compatible with his way of thinking. So we're going to be, I think, using and watching his videos and reading his writings for a long, long time to come. You know, when he had some passion about Lottie Leniers or, or uh, Artish Novel or something, or somebody, he would love to sort of experience them with you and lead you through these poems or music musicians that he that he adored and and let you have you see how, what he saw in them and of course if there were you know questions he could always answer them just always he knew everything he was confined to to the physical body or physical location but his mind was so wild and so he, he's so energetic his dimension of interest in all aspects of art uh, it was great. He was a great reader as well. He, you ask him the latest uh, novel, and he knows the answer because he has read it. And I don't know he, how he found time to do it, but uh, uh, in other words, he was a, he was an amazingly capacious man in terms of the interest, and then how he uh, was able to communicate about his you know his knowledge. Our need to individuate was huge and that we, he let us do that. Uh, and I think that that was the greatest thing that he did for us actually, aside from the really strong background that he gave us in training ourselves in terms of visual memory and so on, that he let us do whatever we wanted and encouraged us to do it. And even when we went very far afield, as I did, he was still encouraging. I was with him the day before he died and, and held his hand, so, you know, I, that, that never stopped being a, a very close relationship. And As a result of his generosity to the museum and to the University of California, Berkeley, we now have one of the best university collections of Ming and Qing Dynasty painting, uh, Chinese painting, in, in the country. He was not a scholar who had to uh, overwhelm you with his scholarship. He just uh, let his sentences uh, be understood by everybody. He really sort of opened up and started, uh, uh, sort of founded the field of Chinese painting in America.